Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mutual Knowledge. And in today's episode, my guest is Chris Gianelloni. Hi, Chris. Hello. So, Chris, you are notably one of the founders of Blink Labs, and you did many other things. Can you please tell us what you do in this beautiful world that is the blockchain industry? Uh, yeah. So, currently, we write a lot of open source software for Cardano. Um, we've been doing open source for an extremely long time. Most of the members of our team have worked together through various jobs uh, throughout the years. So we have a very tight rapport. Uh, and, you know, we've uh, been essentially trying to build out the base layer and then everything on top of it of an ecosystem using the Go language uh, on Cardano. We are typically like infrastructure engineers. So we've come from, you know, like Kubernetes and cloud native and, you know, like all of those tool sets and all of those things are all written in Go. So we were in a Go mindset when we first came to Cardano, uh, you know, and we looked around and saw that the Go stuff wasn't, you know, like good enough to do things with. So we started from the ground up writing the network protocol and, you know, basically starting literally at the, the, the base layer as low as we could go and working our way up. And we've been slowly filling out all of the functionality and capability, you know, to have parity with the other things on the chain. Okay. And uh, question, why did you guys on, in the first place choose Cardano um, compared to other, uh, other blockchains? Well, uh, we actually do have, you know, exposure to other chains and things like that. So, you know, we use other chains for various things, but Cardano is where we decided to build. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for it. And the rigorous approach, you know, the scientific based approach to trying to, you know, solve the problems and that sort of thing appealed to us for sure. Uh, that definitely brought us around looking at how Ouroboros worked and that sort of thing really took us uh, into the community. And it was the community that sold us. Uh, we have previously worked in, you know, like large open source projects. And, you know, it's really the community that makes it and we found that the community around Cardano, there were a lot more people that are honest, like builders, like they want to build something. They weren't necessarily around just to speculate on token prices or things like that. Uh, also, at the time, there weren't very many native tokens. There were no DEXs or anything like that. So the landscape was also extremely different uh, on, on Cardano because we joined before smart contracts launched. Uh, we originally started a stake pool and we're running as a stake pool operator uh, before we decided to close down our stake pool and just pivot full time to software. Wonderful. And in your opinion, uh, is this, uh, this ecosystem now mature for uh, applications outside of the, of the decentralized world? Uh, because, you know, many in the corporate world, for example, many... Uh, Many companies are having blockchain initiatives, many banks and uh, mm -hmm. insurance companies and, and sometimes governments, although that's not really the same use case they have. But uh, many companies are willing to implement bits of decentralized and untemperable um, tech in, uh, in their uh, cocktail. And do you think the Cardano right. ecosystem is uh, is now mature enough for that, for example, to have a partnership with a bank such as HSBC or something like that? It's mature enough for the early adopters. It's mature enough for the ones in the, the, the companies that, you know, are willing to adopt cutting edge technology and are willing to put in the work because they understand that the rewards are higher for that higher risk. Um, you know, is it ready for like the average company, you know, that doesn't have a high tech budget, doesn't have things like that to come in and, you know, just start building. Uh, not if they have a significantly complex use case, right? Mm -hmm. So the answer is most likely no. But, you know, uh, a company, you know, that has a, a lot of tech prowess, absolutely, the building blocks are here, right? You know, and uh, uh, the, the, 
they're either here or they're being built. And that's kind of where things come in. And this is something that I like. And one of the reasons why we also joined Cardano is that a lot of the stuff is nascent. The technology is new. And it means that we get to have a bigger say in how it works because we're here as the things are being built. Right. You know, so even if you're just a a consumer of a product or whatever, if you're there at the very beginning of it, you really can drive that roadmap. Right. Like you can help drive the innovation. Allow me to paraphrase that movie with Nicolas Cage, uh, Lord of War, when the guy sells weapons. But he says, oh, the first time you do that, you don't exactly know what you're doing. But gosh, this is exciting because everything has to be built. And uh, and this is like building a new country or or starting. any type of new project. All right. And so um, you talked about the community. How important for you is the um, the impact of a community in the success of a project? I'm not talking about uh, business per se, because of course we can imagine that business is very important and marketing is important, community impact is important, but I'm more talking about the, the quality of the feedback. Um, how do you think that being close to your community helps, you know, in, in terms of gathering their feedback and in terms of delivering a product that they re- they really like in, in the end. Um, is it is it is it you know the proper ecosystem to have a bottom up approach basically? Right. I mean, I think so. Um, I also think that interestingly enough, it's a good ecosystem for a top down also, and meeting in the middle is kind of it. And uh, that's that's one of the things that I've found interesting is there is a dichotomy in the ecosystem between, you know, like some of the bigger money interests that have been putting in a lot of things and are building, you know, kind of from the top down and the community interests and how they're building and establishing, you know, like things that the community wants, certain levels of like decentralization, this sort of stuff is being kind of established at the community layer and brought up and they're meeting in the middle. Um, as you know, as someone that does mostly open source for a lot of what we're doing, the community is a, a little more important and being close to the community uh, you know, matters a lot. And a lot of it is, for lack of a better term, kind of the feel of the community, the vibe of the community, right? And the community is very welcome to builders coming in and you know, working and basically rolling up their sleeves and getting things done. And, you know, some communities are like, oh, well, you know, you didn't do anything for the token price. And it's like, okay, well, but I built this thing and it's cool, you know, and uh, it's, (laughs) I feel like that kind of stuff is much more appreciated, uh, you know, in this community than uh, necessarily in some others. And I'm not pointing at any in particular, just, you know, everyone can point at any community, even our own and look at bad stuff or whatever. But uh, I just felt in general that Cardano was more welcoming. That's fascinating. Uh, You know, uh, every time I supervise software development, that was a very tough choice. But uh, you have met Fare, my my co-founder at Sky Protocol, and uh, he's a very um, tech savvy person. And sometimes Mm -hmm. there's a battle between us in terms of management uh, because he likes fancy tech but not in the pejorative way like he doesn't like tech just because it is fancy and looks cool it he likes techs uh, technological stacks because of their capabilities the problem is that sometimes these technologies might be so peculiar so specific so good and so um, that it requires an elite developer to to give uh, to give it its full potential and sometimes you're just thinking, right. okay, maybe we should, for this specific case, use something else, something basically that is a very well-known terrain, something that, well, what if the, the developer gets replaced because the developer leaves the project? Or what if we find somebody else? Or what if we have a problem? Or what if we have that question that nobody has ever answered? Well, we're going to have to build our own library for that. And... Sometimes it's it's hard right. to reinvent the wheel when you already have to invent a wheel, uh, a principal wheel. You can't reinvent the wheel on the secondary tracks as well. So um, th- that's always a tough choice. And I like the fact that on Cardano, we have many people building stuff. And sometimes we have solutions to problems that didn't uh, didn't arise yet. But I like the fact, the fact that they are here. And indeed, I didn't find that so much on other blockchains. That's also why we had that... Uh, that fondness with Cardano, Cardano, because 
building libraries that will not be useful immediately, but that will be eventually useful for uh, one day, and that will basically sol solve a person's problem that they couldn't have solved, them uh, solved themselves, is something I found very appealing. Is that the way you feel yeah. as well? Absolutely. In fact, that's exactly it. Uh, you know, we, we've spent a, a long time, uh, you know, working on a lot of these things, and we're slowly working towards building a, car a full Cardano node in Go. And, you know, it's it's a long process. You know, when you talk to somebody and it's like, oh, well, you're going to go write a whole new blockchain node. And people are like, OK, that's a multi-year process. And we're like, yeah. And so we started and just, you know, started down the path and knowing that, you know, again, it's something where it's like no one's going to care. No one's going to care in six months. No one's going to care in a year. Right. They're not going to care until you've already put in a lot of work. And it's just because, again, you're not selling a token with it. You're not doing anything like that. Right. You know, it's just building infrastructure essentially it's like the the most boring stuff <laughs> to get built but it's also the things that builds the bridges and you know like and I, I mean like thinking real world right you know the buildings the bridges you know like all of the stuff it's all infrastructure and it's it, it you build something sexy out of it when you're done right you know you have this beautiful skyline with you know like bridges coming in or things like that right but you know to start with you're starting with bricks you're starting with you know mortar you're starting <laughs> it's it's very boring right <laughs> yeah the, the, the company saying oh i do uh, i do industrial decoration yes but please i'm the one doing uh, doing bridges and uh, and buildings and uh, the the bricks and mortar company is saying bitches please i'm the one who, i'm the one you depend on yeah indeed and <laughs> right right kind of I saw many projects on uh, on Blink Labs um, Blink Labs website that this is what you know brought us to to work together. Um, uh, we're definitely super happy yeah. to to have you guys at, uh, as partners. But uh, one of the things I uh, I was thinking of is with all these projects, are are there a few or is there one that you're even prouder of? Something that you know that you think about saying, oh, we pulled this off and and that kicks ass. Ah, yeah. So the the one that we've probably been doing the most stuff with is Adder, uh, and, and Adder is uh, it's it, we we say it's a tool for you know following the tail uh, of uh, the Cardano blockchain. And uh, what what it does is you just it connects to the chain, right? It connects to the public nodes and starts following the the changes from the you know the blocks. And you can filter and, you know, put in what kind of filters you want. So, like, you can narrow it down to what you care about, the events, essentially, that get created on the chain. So you can filter it down to an address or, you know, a stake pool, or you could filter it to a particular asset, right, or combinations of these things. Um, you know, so you can say, oh, I only want to know when Sky, uh, you know, gets traded on these three DEX addresses. And, you know, so you can put that in and then it creates an event and those events have multiple types of output and they can be whatever. So it has like webhooks. Uh, it has a, a built in discord uh, filter for the webhook uh, so that it you can send stuff directly to a discord channel. It has uh, desktop notifications. So like you can run it on your Mac or, you know, like your Windows machine or whatever and have the filters and it'll show a desktop notification when that event happens. So, you know, you can set it up for transactions. Like I said, you know, you want to know every time, you know, something trades or every time, you know, an NFT gets sold of a particular project or even just watch your own wallet. Um, you know, you can have that and have the notifications. And we've been trying to build it out uh, with as many different possibilities as we can. So we actually have a web app, uh, or sorry, a, a mobile app also that we've built that will accept the notifications from it. And uh, we haven't had as much time as we want to fully delve into it. But the idea is we want to be able to have custom uh, notifications, you know, over a, a mobile app with basically whatever kind of filters that you want. Uh, the interesting thing about it is the way that we built it is there's an embedded output, which is basically allows you to also use Adder as a library. And so we use it for building almost all of our other tools uh, because we now have a event pipeline with filtering. So we can say, oh, you know, I want to build a tool that does this. OK, we, we take the pipeline, we filter it to what we want, and now we have that tool almost already done. Now we just have to write the business logic of that tool. We don't have to write all the chain processing parts over and over again. 
you know, you know, this is exactly why I was super happy to to start collaborating with you guys, and you know, we're th still thinking to uh, about what we're going to do and to which extent. But that, for me, that's the exact um, prolongation, uh, the, the exact um, path that we should go, uh, we should follow regarding data availability. Data availability in the first place uh, in the short term, term you know when it gets implemented at t plus one is just to help blockchain scale so that's great dexes insurance right. companies uh decentralized storage decentralized anything can lower the transaction fees their computational fees you can have privacy that's great uh but in the future that means that there is a strong b2b use case here for all the the blockchain initiatives that we'll have in five six years that means that in the in the future we could implement that to many many other pieces of tech of uh, many other business intelligence tools and uh, build uh, build connectors on all the make.ai and zapier and, um, and all these crms um, that's something yeah. we're already very happy to do at moon because we have already a, um, one of our sub companies that is web3 enabler and that does payment solutions for salesforce and uh that, that's okay. that's the the goal in the long run because we're, i think data availability should be also something that will that could be usable to query the blockchain in real time and i'm you know i was super happy to see that you guys did that uh, and you know th this gets out of the little geeky bubble of one blockchain or the blockchain industry in general and um, yeah that pleases me a lot because i i don't come from this industry in the first place so that, that's uh, right. Right. that's something very pleasant to me. And so, um, are the projects uh, aside from this one uh, that you that you were super happy to do, or projects that you struggled with? <laughs> struggled with that one is easy, and that's actually Goroboros, which is the the, the Ouroboros, uh library that we have in Go. And uh, just in general, things have improved dramatically since we first started working on it. As far as um, the specifications that are getting created by like IOHK, uh, that sort of thing, they've become a lot, a lot richer, right? Yeah, because they now realize that there are so many other people that are building like even at these base levels in Rust and Go and TypeScript and, and, and these things. So. At first, it was, you know, building a proxy that we wrote so that we could put it in between a Cardano node and a Cardano client, uh, you know, like CLI or a web app or whatever, and literally sniffing the traffic between them and seeing, you know, like, uh, oh, what are the actual bytes and trying to decode it to figure out what payloads were being sent. Uh, because in in a lot of cases, you know, like the uh, the, the CDDL, uh, the definition for the network spec would say, oh, and this is a certificate. One of, one of a, like, and it didn't say what the certificates look like. It just says well, the certificate goes here, and it was that way on purpose because it was extensible. But the point is, is we're like, okay, but there's like nine certificate types. What do they look like? Uh, there's nothing that shows it, right? So we had to figure those things out. Um, so it was definitely the biggest challenge is, you know, just understanding how all of the different pieces work and a lot of the serialization, uh, a lot of the data structures that were used on chain weren't as well defined. Everything since all of the most recent eras, uh, like Babbage, Conway, all that stuff, they've been super good at making sure that it's very well specified and in, in defined uh, so that it makes it easier for everyone else to adopt these things. So I'm not saying that we had any part in that or anything like that, you know, but I'm just saying like it, it, things have improved so much uh, since the beginning. It was definitely the biggest challenge. Uh, we had found that other people had started working on it and they basically hit a couple road bumps uh, that we had hit and they gave up and we just went and just stubborn right through it, right? Like just kept, <laughs> kept trying uh, until we got it working, so. You know, there is that, uh, that proverb uh, that says courage is when you know it's going to be painful but you, you keep going anyway and stupidity yeah. is the same thing and that's why life is hard and <laughs> because, because exactly when you build a library you're basically building pieces of code that many people will be using in the future and you don't know if that's how you're going to circumvent problems if it's not there it's perhaps because because it's not feasible and same thing when you're building any type of tools for the professionals so 
thank you for that. I mean, that, that's always that's always a leap of faith. So uh, I, I like the stubbornness yeah, here, yeah. indeed. All right, and um, in the future, what do you think the uh, the Cardano ecosystem? Because this is what the one you, we were talking about, but maybe the blockchain industry in general. Uh, what do you think uh, are the trends that um, that will be basically evident in the future? Uh, appear as evidently helping the blockchain. So basically, what what are the things that we are thinking about now and that will be a standard in a few years? Something that we absolutely yeah. need. We we were talking about data availability, but maybe interoperability, right. maybe something else. For sure. For sure. I mean, uh, interoperability, but like not in the way that a lot of people currently think of, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff. When you think of current interoperability, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to bridge this or maybe that, you know, I'm using something on a centralized exchange or uh, this sort of stuff. It'll be more uh, integrations, you know, like you had uh, alluded to, you know, like integrations with Salesforce, integrations with other systems to where the interoperability between the different blockchains is far less visible. Um, you know, I, I see a lot more of maybe even, a, let's say, L3s or whatever, but like app chains, um, you know, and even short lived app chains, you know, for specific purposes and that sort of stuff, you know, so uh, just using like a off my head, you know, kind of example, like Ticketmaster goes and spins up, you know, like some layer three app chain that's explicitly for this Taylor Swift concert in LA ticket sales. And so it's it's built for scale, it's built for one task, right? You know what I mean? Like that sort of thing. And then it could fall down, you know, and eventually settle lower, um, but like that sort of thing. But then also that entire thing being available via API, with automatic, you know, Babel fee type conversions between whatever, so that, you know, you can put your credit card in into any system, uh, you know, and it's completely transparent to the user what's actually happening. But in the real world, they're getting a QR code, you know, in their email that represents an actual on-chain asset that is provable, right? You know, so when you're scanning that QR code, it's to like a ticket that has been created on-chain, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing, instead of just in someone's database so they can reduce uh you know like fraud uh from scalping you know like they can put rules on it even because it's again a custom blockchain right so they can say oh you can only buy x number of them you can only trade it between this or that or you just can't transfer it in x amount of time i mean they can basically completely control the rules right so we're not necessarily talking fully public blockchain but the point is is those would be built on these public blockchains as we add more layers of abstraction and capabilities onto them. Because the idea is, is you, you're not going to onboard billions of people onto an L1 chain, right? Like that's not the design. They're not designed. Like we, we would blow through so much disk space in like hours, right? If we had enough blocks to cover everything everybody was doing in any kind of transaction whatsoever on any chain, right? Like we just... We'd run out of space so fast. So, you know, not everything is meant to be persistent forever and not, every, right? <laughs> and again, data availability, you know, the point is, is it's to be persisted for as long as necessary, not forever, right? That, that's interesting because you, you're pushing this further than I thought. Um, <laughs> I, I love the idea of what you're saying regarding interoperability and having stuff that is not persistent, but actually, actually yes, Web3 will be mature when it looks like web 2 so with very easy to connect apis right. stuff that you you didn't didn't even know you were interacting with another api gathering data from this part or that part and indeed now every time we're going to a cryptocurrency convention every time they make us download an app that is here that has its own chat channel so that we don't even have to stop stalk people on linkedin or telegram we can discuss things we can have right our little uh, little conversations. We can have the, the whole uh, locations plan in order to know where the food trucks are and where the booths are and so on. So yeah, I, I have that, um, that feeling that indeed stuff that is, that is not persistent could be a, a very inter interesting trend in the future. And I thank you for that. I didn't see it that way. And indeed, that's already what's happening in Web2. So in a way, Web2, Web three would right, be natural right. when Web two itself gets uh, when, when it looks like Web two itself. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I a lot of times try to uh, oversimplify in my in my head some of the stories. And when you start thinking about stuff like that way, and like let's oversimplify again a little bit, right? So you, your Web two company or whatever has a database, and like I'm just going to pretend for a minute, and I know you know like crypto people are going to crucify me for this one, but like let's pretend for a minute that the bank, the ledger between the banks, right, is actually trusted in some way, but. Uh, you know, so the point is, is you have all of this activity that happens in your own little database, right? And you're not that worried about it, but you get some transactions in and some transactions out, and eventually you put that stuff in a bank, right? You either it comes in from payments from Stripe or for whoever, you know, because we've had some API interactions. But the bulk of what's happening is happening in this database that the bank knows nothing about, right? In the end result, all that they know is like that output, the world moving that way to where you know it's like. Again, the immutable ledger is great for the things that you want to be able to always prove later forever, right? You know, and following the money is a really good use for it. But there's just so much other data. And I mean, even transactional data that isn't financial, right, that happens. You know, you go to a website, it starts up some session that follows you around the website so that they, you know, show you things, you know, oh, you just looked at this, you just did that, right? Uh, you know, all of that stuff is actually transactions happening in it's just in some database and it's thrown away essentially, right? Or they just run some analytics on it. But, you know, to, to replace that paradigm with essentially a blockchain based where the foundational root of trust of all of the things ends up being blockchain, you, you, you have to have, you know, essentially these areas where you're able to service the Temporary data. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, uh, fascinating. I know that. And so, to achieve that, what do you think? Um, to to end this interview, uh, uh, what would be the the hurdles, the um, the challenges, the the painful points in order to achieve that? Uh, so currently, it's putting the things together. So, you know, we're, we're just starting to get to where we've got decentralized storage. We're just starting to get to have decentralized compute, right? Like we're starting to get to have decentralized identity. We're starting to get to have all of these things and, you know, piecing them together into like usable APIs, SDKs, that sort of thing, you know, that makes it easier for uh, your average business to be able to consume them and start building on them it, it is really it, right? I mean, to be able to get to these points, you know, the, the reason why, you know, some of it might be on a blockchain or whatever is because you eventually get to be able to build this entire elastic business, so to speak, right, for a short term use. So like I said, when I was talking, uh, you know, like just using like that Ticketmaster example, that would essentially be its own full everything, right? Like it's got its own payment processing, its own everything. And the output just ends up being who has what ticket, right? Or, 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 you know what I mean, like the tickets and the serial numbers. That's all you really need when you're done. Uh, you don't have to necessarily have all of the who clicked where, you know, like sales type, uh, you know, stuff persisted forever. You know, you can get your analytics out of it and throw it away. But you do want the ticket, you know, the actual financial transaction data. Okay, so, the, so uh, basically the even the tickets themselves would be a temporary NFT just for the time of the, um, of the event. And then that's not even needed. Well, maybe there would be one oh, yeah. a, a specific NFT for the invoice, maybe. Right, right. I mean, you know, when you so when you think about it, you there's a difference between uh, you know the the receipt that you get in your email and the actual ticket, right? You know, so if you look at it that way, you can have one as like a collectible, and it could be the ticket itself, you know, which is something that you would like redeem essentially the original payment, uh, you know, to get. And that could even be streamlined so that it's kind of invisible to the user. I mean, that's really, really it. The, the biggest hurdles are, are rarely technical and are almost always usability, right? Like, use, you know, it's uh, the user experience is, is if you make it hard, I'm not going to do it, right? <laughs> I'm going to take that because, you know, I, I have my pencil here to check and to make to draw a mark every time I hear some keywords. And uh, yeah, basically this this one is the one that has um, that has been quoted the most every time I'm asking in this podcast. Uh, hey, what do you think the, the biggest challenge is 
most of the time people will tell me UX usability and uh, yeah. indeed I used to, uh, I'm used to saying if your grandmother cannot use it it's not mature enough to be mainstream so right all right yeah yeah thank you so much about that um, I had a great time any last word to finish this interview that interview oh man um... <laughs> Uh, well, uh, if anyone is going to be at uh, the Cardano event Rare Evo, uh, we're going to be there. Blink Labs, you'll be able to find us wandering around the floor. Uh, we are actually going to be with our partners, uh, Digitalis. We have a booth, and uh, you'll be able to find us. We're going to be lounging around. We've got uh, some lounge chairs. And it'll be fun. Where, where's that? In which city? Uh, that's going to be Las Vegas, uh, August 15th. Okay. Everyone, you heard that, Las Vegas, August 15th. Check them out. Go to see Blink Labs. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Gautier.